Hi, I'm Carol Owens, and I'm here today to tell you about the founding of our hyperlocal newspaper, Stockbridge Updates. It was a day in January 2020. It was before COVID, and we had no idea what was coming. We sat around my living room. And I said, I have an idea. And I told them about starting a hyperlocal newspaper in Stockbridge for Stockbridge residents. And I told them why. Because I went to the last town meeting. And when you walk in, there's a table. And you kind of register as a voter and they hand you the warrant. And the warrant is the list of articles that they're going to discuss and ask the people to vote on at town meeting. And I realized that for a lot of people coming in, that was the first time <laughs> they had seen the issues that they were going to be asked to vote on. And that was just amazing to me. And I thought, you know, there has to be a way to inform the voters. Because somewhere I read that an informed electorate is the basis of a strong democracy. So we sat around my living room, January 2020, pre-COVID, and we discussed the possibility of starting a hyper-local newspaper. There were 12 to 16 people there. And when the meeting was all over, everybody but two said, isn't that marvelous if you really want to do it, but I don't think I have time. Two folks stuck around. And on another program, on another day, I'm going to have those two very special people with me and we'll talk some more, but for now. Between January and the launch of the first issue was eight months. First issue came out in August 2020, and that was 100 issues ago, each issue running about 5,000 words. Every 10 issues is a book. 100 issues is 10 books. So a little over four years, a little over 100 issues, and 10 books worth, here we are. So that first issue came out <clears throat> in August 2020, and the response was nothing I ever expected. One of the government officials went to town attorney and asked if I could be stopped. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And the town attorney read the town official, the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, and said that would be a no. So then this town official called me and said, you may wonder how I know what happened with the town attorney, she said, this is what happened when I called the town attorney, and that is how I know. And she said, I didn't get what I wanted, which was to stop you, so I'm calling to tell you, you will be required to pass every issue of Stockbridge updates in front of the town government for approval before you publish. And I said, gee whiz, that's not going to happen. What else do you want to do? She hung up on me. I don't know what else she wanted to do. So then the second issue came out, and I began to realize that there were issues with the issue, 
and I put together an editorial board to try to make some very, very good decisions. Are we accepting letters to the editor? Do we have any rules about that? Well, yes, we did. No ad hominem attacks. No overly long submissions. So we put a limit on the word count. We said we wouldn't publish anything that was personally critical of anyone. Speak to the issues, not to the people. And then we face the most interesting problem of them all. What do you publish and what don't you publish? You know, when folks talk about um, a news outlet that is reputed to be uh, prejudiced or very one-sided, they always talk to you about content. But the real prejudice is in what you print and what you don't. So we made a very simple decision. We're going to print it all. If we know it, the reader's going to know it. If someone submits an opinion with which we do not agree, they submit, we post. If a meeting goes on and we think it's boring or unnecessary or overly long, no matter, we report it. So that was the beginning of some of the rules that I set up with my editorial board after two issues because I realized decisions had to be made. You know, we started with 200 names. I happened to have 200 names in my email. That was it. 200 email addresses of folks that lived in Stockbridge. That's what I had. So first issue went out, 200 people received it. The most amazing thing happened. By the second or third issue, it was a thousand. And after that, it was almost every household in town. But what was even crazier is we'd have, oh, I must tell you, there's 725 permanent re residents in Stockbridge. Much more than that if you count the part-time residents, almost 4,000. But of permanent year-round residents in Stockbridge, registered voters, 725. We were reaching them all, but that wasn't the funny part. Funny part was we were getting 5,000 opens per issue, which means it was being forwarded all over the place, or folks were opening, closing, reopening, closing, reopening. Maybe they were reading one article at a time. We don't know, but it was a numeric success. You are told constantly that the media is giving you what you want. That the media, print, television, internet, they're giving you what you want. Are they? Or are they force-feeding you what they want you to have? It's an interesting question. Do you want sensation? Do you want, do you want titillation? Do you want news smoothed out so it's just not so hard to swallow? Or do you just want plain facts? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. When Thomas Jefferson was asked, would you prefer a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, he said, I should not hesitate before preferring the latter. Wow, anarchy but a newspaper. Why, why, why would he say that? And he explained it. In a democracy, the people 
are the only censors, this is the part I'm reading, are the only censors of their governors. The way to present any irregular interposition of the people, like forcing or removing rights, imprisoning without a trial, any irregular imposition of the people, just give them the full information of their affairs. Because the basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And you can only do that with newspapers. So for me, this was a kind of calling. It was very important to me, and it was very important to me to get it right. Look, we had some fun along the way. I scooped the bigger newspapers in Berkshire County twice. That was a fun day. I got to spotlight some people that I think are very good people, and that was fun. But the real job was answering the question, what does the public want? Let me give you some choices. About 11 years ago, General Electric lost a case, and the result was that they were made to clean up the PCBs that they had been dumping in Berkshire waterways and even roadsides and along the and along the land. And even if they only put it in waterways, when those waterways flooded and washed over the land, the PCBs were carried with it. Stockbridge Golf Course, lovely place, lots of members. And I wonder how many of them know that as they golf their nine or 18 holes, they're slogging through PCBs. So they were asked to clean it up. Now, that was years ago. And what happened was that there was an agreement during the Obama administration. And that agreement was to dredge the waterways, no, no imposition on the land, just the waterways, carry those PCBs by train out of Berkshire County to a location, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know where it is, but there are two approved PCB storage locations in the United States because it turns out that, number one, nobody knows how to destroy a PCB. Once you made it, you're stuck with it. And the second thing is, Storing it is harrowing. You know, when I wrote my first book, Berkshire Cottages, I interviewed some men in an assisted living facility. And they were suffering, and frankly, they were dying. And what they wanted to tell me about is driving the trucks that transported the PCBs to the river where they dumped it, to the Housatonic River, where they dumped most of them. Uh, second most was in Silver Lake in Pittsfield. And they wanted to tell me the story. And one piece of the story stuck with me when they started to talk about storing PCBs. And that was that they were made to or invited to um, wear rubber boots and rubber, rubber gloves. They were provided for them. And they couldn't transport more than one or two truckloads before those rubber gloves and rubber boots started to dissolve. And then they were provided new pairs. How do you store it? There was a suggestion that they store it in leaf. And they would put the equivalent of sort of two or three um, trash bags in a hole in the ground and pour the PCBs in it. And from the first time I heard of this amazing idea, um, I thought, gosh, 
Would it take longer or shorter to eat through the lining in the lead dump, the lead PCB dump? Would it take longer or shorter to eat through that lining and seep into the water table and the ground and the groundwater than it took to eat through the boots of those men that drove the trucks? Well, that was the suggestion, good or bad, of the second agreement. GE went to court again, said they understood they had to clean it up, but they didn't want to hydraulically dredge and put it on trains and ship it out to the approved storage. They wanted to dig that hole in Lee. Now, here's the question. When do you want to know all this? Do you want to know this in real time, 11 years ago, when it's happening? Do you want to know it before the final agreement is signed? When do you, the public, want to know it? Because I'll tell you when they want you to know it. Never. I think you should know it in real time. So in addition to Stockbridge Update's regular issues, it has Stockbridge Update's alerts. You have no idea. Remember the town official that called me up and said, I want everything you write approved before you send it out. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. You cannot imagine the response to a Stockbridge Update alert. How could you tell them that? You're going to destroy our plan. But here's the alternative. The alternative is the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and GE, General Electric, finally told the people about the agreement that they made with uh, cleaning up, an interesting term, the PCBs, 11 years later in a public meeting, and they stood up and they said, the agreement has been finalized. We're here to share with you the implementation. That's why you want newspapers. That's what Jefferson meant. Right now, there's a group very angry at Stockbridge Updates for something we wrote, and they said, you are going to disturb what happens, and you have got to tell your readers to trust the process. Your choice. Do you want to trust the process or be part of the process? And if you want to be part of the process, you stand up, you support, you pay for, you get your newspapers, and then you demand that those newspapers achieve a level of quality, consistent honesty, the rules of journalism, and they give you the best facts that they possibly can, and they correct and revise and add to every day following. Folks, there are no alternative facts. There's only one set. A fact, like Dorothy Sayers said, is a hard, knobbly thing that will not change and will not yield. There are no alternate facts, but there are alternate forms of government. It's up to you to decide. For now, we at Stockbridge Updates are more than happy to take the flack or more than happy to post the angry letters so you can see who's angry about what. We'll post your opinion, whether we agree with it or not. And for our opinion, we have an editorial. We'll print one every issue. So www.stockbridgeupdates.com. If you go to the site, not only can you see the latest issue, not only can you sign up to be another subscriber, but you can see all hundred 
of the issues that preceded. And now, the very important thank yous. From the very first issue, there was a group of talented photographers and writers that live in Stockbridge that just popped up and said, I have a picture, I have a column, I have an idea. And they have enriched Stockbridge updates ever since. And then, just as a little teaser, there are the two who stayed way back in that day in January. And you'll meet them on the, another program on CTSB. I'm Carol Owens. Go get Stockbridge updates. And thank you very much. Postscript. I forgot to tell you the most important thing. After four years and those now famous 100 issues, we're in talks about expanding. You know, we are so lucky to have the Berkshire Eagle and the Berkshire Edge. It's marvelous in a community this size to have two vibrant newspapers. But you know, the Eagle focuses on Pittsfield, it always has, and breaking news in the other towns. The Edge is pretty well situated in Great Barrington. Me, I'm a South County girl. There are 18 towns in South County, that is south of Pittsfield, 18 of them. Seven of them, I may be wrong, but I think it's seven, have hyperlocal newspapers, including Stockbridge updates. But you know, that still leaves an uncovered area. And Stockbridge would like to stretch out its arms and embrace all of South County and see what we can do with an expanded Stockbridge updates. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.